Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. We all belong outside. We're drawn to nature. Whether it's the recorded sounds of the ocean we doze off to or the succulents that adorn our homes, nature makes all of our lives, well, better. Despite all this, we often go about our busy lives removed from it. But the outdoors is closer than we realize. With All Trails, you can discover trails nearby and explore confidently. With offline maps and on trail navigation, download the free app today and make the most of your summer with All Trails. Super Real. Hey, I'm Julian Morgans, and you're listening to What It Was Like. The show that asks people who have lived through big, dramatic events what it was like. I've got a bit of a confession to make. I'm not really a sports guy. When my friends are watching football or, you know, the Olympics... I try, I really try. I sit there and I'm like watching it and I'm asking questions and, but I just, you know, I, I don't feel it. I just don't, I just don't quite get it. I just can't get excited about balls or finishing lines until, until recently, until very recently, like within the last few days, I've been watching the Olympics and I've found something that I truly care about and that's losing. Hear me out. Okay. So in every match of the Olympics, most of the athletes don't win. You know, they've, they've come from all around the world to gather in this one place after training for years and years, and then they don't get what they want, and you're watching them in one of the worst moments of their lives, one of the most disappointing experiences they've ever had, and you're watching it play out. It's like, it's like reality TV, but, but with way higher stakes. And you just never get that in any other forum. You know, usually disappointment happens in privacy. Like if a friend of yours, if if they don't get a promotion, you don't sit there and watch them trudge back from the office to their desk and then sadly look out the window. Or if someone you know gets sick or divorced or if they declare bankruptcy or any of the other things, like the curly things that life throws our way, you don't see it. You learn about these things later, you know, maybe your friend will tell you, but, but you don't just watch it play out, except at the Olympics. In each game, you get to see human beings grappling with failure as it's happening. And I just think that is so interesting. And it's today's interview that's made me realize this, because today's story is about what happens when an Olympian doesn't win. I won't give away too much in this intro, but here's the basics. You're about to hear from a man named Kip McDaniel, who's a journalist, a financial expert, and a former athlete. He grew up on Vancouver Island, where he was part of the rowing community. And that's how he knew a coach by the name of Harold Backer. And Harold, he was a local legend. He was a three-time Olympian who retired after Barcelona in 1992. And he came home, back to the island, to start a financial advisory business for the locals, which meant he'd been managing their retirement savings. As Kip will explain, Harold went missing in 2015, and that's when everything fell apart. Because it turned out that Harold hadn't been managing people's retirement savings. In fact, he'd been running a Ponzi scheme, and everyone's money was all gone. Harold's fall from grace tore a hole through this community of about 350,000. He didn't lose money on the scale of Bernie Madoff, but everyone on the island knows someone who was affected. Everyone knows someone who couldn't retire as they had originally planned, or they couldn't send their kids to college because their savings were all gone. And I think the subtext through all of this is Harold's status as an Olympian, as an athlete who never quit, even when he needed to. And it's this part of the story that has shifted my thinking 
around the Olympics. Because really, the Olympics, it's like this weird machine that draws in the world's most psychotically dedicated, deeply competitive people. And it denies most of them the thing that they really want the most. And then it sends them all home on their way to get on with their lives. Today's story is about what can happen next after they get home. And to tell you that story, I bring you Kip McDaniel. Hey, Kip. Welcome to the show. Uh, Happy to be here. So tell me about where you grew up, or specifically, tell me about Vancouver Island. Set the scene for me. Vancouver Island is on the west coast of Canada. It's a large island, you know, a couple hundred uh, kilometers long. And it's known for being by far the mildest part of Canada, unless it's become um, like an athletic mecca for people to come and train. Um, And so I grew up there and um, I grew up surrounded by athletes. It helps that my, my father was on the national rowing team. My older brother was a rower. We were just embedded in the athletic community and everything was about sports. And so it was not unusual at all for us to be um, friends and casual acquaintances with Olympians and Olympic gold medalists. I started rowing when I was 12. Um, rowing in Vancouver, because you need unfrozen water to row, it's unsurprising that rowing in, in um, Vancouver Island and in, really within a sort of 10 kilometer radius of where I grew up is a huge hotbed of rowing. And um, it became apparent to me that um, it was a sport. I knew pretty quickly it was a sport I could be good at. I could do the motion and I was willing to put in the work. I had phenomenal teammates. I had phenomenal coaches. I was almost always coached by Olympic rowers or people who had coached Olympic rowers from the age of sort of 15 onwards um, because they all live in this community. And so um, it you had a ton of athletes being funneled into that system um, by athletes who had previously been in that system. And it really created for a couple decades just this absolute hotbed of this kind of weird, unique sport um, and that funneled people to a national team and on to the Olympics often. So, so tell me about the first time that you met Harold Backer. You know, I don't remember the first time I met Harold Backer because he, he's, he was one of many people who were just sort of around. You at a Christmas party that you'd go to with your parents, Harold would be there. Um, it just he was in the sort of social milieu of the like the the schools we went to because he was a coach at Brentwood when I was there, and so I will have just seen him at uh, rowing regattas. I will have seen him at Christmas parties. I think when I was going to college, um, I I may have spoken to him. Um, I was a recruited athlete basically to Princeton and Harvard, and he had been a Princeton rower. And I remember speaking to him. He wasn't, I wouldn't say a warm person. He was quite taciturn, quite quiet, which is not unusual with rowers. Um, It attracts oddballs sometimes because of the demands of success. But he was sort of just always there. He was someone that you knew, you knew in passing, you knew existed. You certainly knew his accomplishments that he'd been to three Olympics and he'd, you know, he'd done pretty well. Um, and then he had just come back to our community and sort of embedded himself in the community as a school teacher. And then eventually as a financial advisor to uh, a bunch of our, our family friends. Just so I've got a mental image, what does he look like? He's like all rowers. He's tall. He's around six foot three. Um, he's always been fit. Um, and so, you know, he's a tall sort of, blonde man always not always the tallest man in the crowd but usually um and uh yes he was a financial advisor which in canada meant that he often uh, helped people with their retirement savings um they would uh give him the retirement savings and he would help them invest off for the future he would help them come up with a financial plan like any good retirement advisor he's going to sit with you and say look if you can save this much money now Um, At a normal rate of return, by the time you turn 65 and are looking towards your golden years, you will be able to manage that process of retirement without too much concern. And so um, he had a number of clients. And unsurprisingly, this is very common in the financial advisor space, 
they were not random people off the street. They were um, people he was close to. You know, off the top of my head, his 1984 Olympic coach, Boris Klavoro, was had basically had Boris had all his money invested um, with Harold. And then his high school coach, who is um, a legend in our sport, a close family friend, a man named Tony Carr, and his wife, Yvonne Carr, who was my preschool teacher, is very incestuous here. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, Harold, Harold was like a son to Tony. And so the cars had um, hired uh, Harold to manage their affairs, as did Tony's son, Brian Carr, another legend of the Canadian rowing scene. And so there was just, you know, a Harold's younger brother had, had handed over some money to Harold to manage. So these weren't, he wasn't putting ads in a newspaper and trying to get um, clients elsewhere. He was just saying, okay, I want to help my close personal family friends, you know, make sure they have retirement money and, um, that's, that's my job. So I think he set that up around 1993. He retired from, um, Olympic rowing after the Barcelona games in 92. And I believe that's when he started his financial advising business as well as coaching rowing at Brentwood college. Okay. Sounds like he's, uh, he's not exactly the kind of person that you would expect is going to attract controversy. He's uh, stable, you know, all these sort of good things, reliable, Oh, you! If you had had to force rank who was going to invite controversy into their lives, Harold would be nowhere near the top of that list. Um, he would probably be near the bottom of the list. So, okay. Well, take us to the story. What happened? Yeah. So it was, it was um, November 2015. I had retired from rowing uh, quite a while before. And I was uh, co- I co-founded a financial magazine based in New York, so I was living in New York. And it was a Tuesday, and I, I think it was a Tuesday, and I got a text message from a close friend saying, "You're not going to believe this, but Harold Backer has gone missing." And I said, "Oh, well, that's weird! Like, blasting past Harold Backer. I wonder, like, I hope he's okay." And the reports coming in via phone and text were that he'd gone for a bike ride that morning, which was not at all uncommon. As I said, he's a really active individual. He'd gone for a bike ride on the trail system on Vancouver Island, which is really extensive. As I said, it's a really active community. There's a beautiful trail system. So the first inkling was that Harold, you know, is he lying in a ditch somewhere? Is he got hit by a car? And so people went out and searched. And then if my memory serves me correctly, the next day I started getting messages from old friends and people in the, in the town saying, well, actually, they found that his passport is not at home. He's left his phone at home, but he's taken his passport, um, which told people that he'd probably gotten on a ferry from Vancouver Island to Washington State, which is quite a short ride. It's a 90-minute ferry ride done quite frequently. I've done it to go cycling in, in, um, in the Olympic Mountains of Washington State, gorgeous area. And so they said, okay, well, that's, that's kind of weird, but we got to change our search from Victoria to South. And so some of his friends, I was told, had gone to Washington State to start looking around. Just to slow it down a moment. So when you're receiving these texts, you know, you knew this man. I mean, how were you feeling? And, and what was your read on the community? Were people stressed out? I mean, when someone goes missing, right, it's, you know, it's a bit scary. It's surprising. It's, it's stressful. It is. And there is a real affinity long after, long after you stop playing a team sport like rowing or an international sport, there's an affinity in that group because you've done stuff that no one else has done. And so you're, you're really tied together for life. And so these were people who were very concerned about Harold because, you know, if you don't come back from a bike ride, we all know what we're concerned about nowadays, right? We're worried you've been hit and are lying somewhere dying. And so there was a real desperation to try and figure out what Harold had done. Uh, like, sorry, what had happened to Harold. I know that some of his friends had literally in these mountains in Washington. It was snowing. It's November. These are high up. His friends trudged through the snow for miles up a hill to see if, there would, if they could find Harold. They were very concerned. Um, and... You know, after someone is missing overnight or missing over two nights, that concern 
just compounds and compounds and compounds. Um, and his parents were at the time both still alive. I'm sure very worried. He had two children, uh, I think two or three children who um, some had were post graduation, some were in college or, or just in high school. And so I can only imagine the knot in their stomach as this was um, happening in real time. Yeah, totally. I mean, especially as, as you were saying, it's, you know, it's snowing. These aren't conditions conducive to survival if you've fallen off your bike or something. But, uh, but the, story, the story took a turn, so take me through it. Yeah, so on Thursday, one of my good friends was waiting in the lineup to get on that ferry to go to Washington State and continue the search. And he got a call, I believe from Harold's wife, he said, don't get on that ferry. Something has come to light. And so that started sending off, uh, maybe not alarm bells, but, you know, the first twinge of what's going on here that I'm not aware of. Because what had happened is I believe that day a letter had shown up or started to show up at the mailboxes of his clients. And the letter was deeply disturbing. It was both quite honest and in retrospect still dishonest in multiple ways the letter basically said i'm sorry i lost all your money in the dot-com bubble of 1999 keep in mind this is 2015 it said i'm sorry i lost all your money in 1999 since then i've been trying to make it back up for you but i am aware i am running a ponzi scheme that's, I think he put it, I'm aware I'm running a Ponzi, is the way he put it. He then said, I have a life insurance policy worth 1500 sorry, $1.5 million. That money should go to my investors to try and make them whole. So what he was saying is, I lost all your money. I'm sorry. I'm going to kill myself. You'll get some insurance money. That was the letter. And it started showing up in rolling waves. And so now the family knew, his clients knew, the community starts knew, law enforcement knew, searchers knew that this was not some man who got hit by a car on the road or some man who'd ridden too high up on a mountain and got caught in snow. This is a man who was running away and maybe going to kill themselves. And so that's that Thursday is when personally I went from a curious bystander and an empathetic bystander to jumping in gear and saying, I need to tell, I need to start following this story. I'm a financial journalist. I know Harold. I know almost all the victims. I know the community. I'm the one to tell the story. And so I started reporting on it right then and there. So what did you do? What, what was your first step? Well, like any journalist, you start calling everyone you know. And then I eventually went um, back home, right? Um, my parents still live uh, 10 minutes from some of the victims. So I went back home, and uh, the first people I spoke to were Tom, Tony and Yvonne Carr. Tony himself was probably coached 10, 20 Olympic medalists in rowing. Um, his wife, as I said, was my preschool teacher, um, very opinionated. And I went to their house and they brought out all the financial statements they'd ever gotten from Harold and the letter. And so I sat with them and just went through everything. And, you know, I'm in finance, so I have a sense of what's normal, what's not. And they were showing me financial statements from like 1999. And even I was just like, guys, you know, this is, this is wrong. This is bad. What was wrong about it? What, what was setting off your alarms? Oh, it was just... To someone who looks at financial statements all day, it was pretty amateurish. Um, it just looked like he had just written it up in a Word document um, when most financial statements are not done via like a Word document. Um, but the most striking thing is the letter. The letter, like even if someone reads you a letter over the phone, it's not like seeing it in person. That this is a man admitting to a, this is a man admitting to, it's a horrible crime. It's not a violent crime. 
But it's a man who has deceived his closest friends for a decade and a half, making them think they're going to be safe. Because what is what is retirement money? It's safety. It's you get to go do the things you want to do, and you're not going to worry about your house. You're not going to worry about your kids, and you might be able to help your your grandkids with college. He has he stole safety from his closest friend. So to see this letter um, was telling. And then to speak to Tony and Yvonne, Yvonne was angry. Yvonne said things that I wouldn't print in a publication. (laughs) Um, Tony was more, Tony, you could tell, and he said in the article eventually, the money, that the money, that's painful. But it was like a son had stolen from him. And I think he said, you can never get your integrity back. And that he'd run away and hadn't been able to come and face them face to face. That was even a further like sort of dagger to the chest. And so Tony and Yvonne spoke to me. Boris Kovora, his um, 1984 Olympic coach, spoke to me. But most people didn't want to talk to me. And I fully understand and respect that. It, there's, there's embarrassment. There's disappointment. There's all those emotions. And sometimes the last thing you want to do when you have those emotions is talk to a journalist. Even if you know that journalist, well, they, they knew who I was. Um, and so it was, I spent a month and a half investigating this and trying to figure out what had happened and give him the backstory and try to explain how it happened. How did a man go from being a pillar to doing this and perpetuating this crime for 15 years? And that... It, it took a long time, and I think the outcome I, it's still perhaps the article I think I'm most proud of, um, and uh, and I'm I'm glad I got to tell that story. But the story it, it didn't end there, as we'll discuss. There's, there's a lot more than that. Yeah, I want to know what you learned. But first, did you speak to Harold's family? I mean, how was his wife doing during this period? So I reached out to his first wife. She did not want to speak. Um, I reached out to her, his, his then wife, um, Elizabeth, she didn't want to speak. I reached out to, um, his daughter who we had gone to the same college. She, I don't believe I back me, but his son did. And I was a little surprised by that is his, uh, his son, Harrison basically, um, wanted to set the record straight on some things. He wasn't going to say my dad didn't do it. That's, but he wanted to make clear that his dad had not armed him financially in any way because there was some of that rumor going around that Harold had left them with a bunch of debt. And he wanted to set the record straight. Um, and as he was, I think he was, he was a 19 year old, but um, when someone's that young, I'm really clear about, okay, you tell him, let's go on the record. We'll be off the record. I was very clear about the rules of engagement, just because you don't want to be taking advantage of people who don't quite understand how you deal with the press. Um, but so that was my only contact with the family. Um, when the article came out, they weren't happy, but that's totally normal. Um, there's no errors in the piece. And, but I, again, as a journalist, you expect that. Um, but so the piece ended because it, I had to publish the thing. And Harold had not, the last sighting of Harold was a security camera in Washington State showing him riding his bike away from the ferry terminal. And that was the last we'd heard of him at the time. And he had suggested in a letter he was going to kill himself. Um, was that plausible? Was it, was, was it believed? I mean, this idea that he was going to kill himself, what was the mood there? No. The, there was two things that made the victims suggest that they didn't believe it. One, why do you need to go to Washington State to do that? Not to be morbid, but why do you need to go to another country to do that? And two, um, insurance company is not going to pay out that money unless they know you are actually dead. And so if he had been in this again, it sounds more, but let's face the fact, if he was going to do that, he would have done it. You would, you would have done it at home. And so uh, Boris Glavora didn't believe it. The, the Tony Carr didn't believe it. Um, no one really believed it. He had, the, the, the thing was too elaborate, what he had done, um, which he had not taken his own phone, but a couple that I spoke to who spoke to him on the ferry said he had a phone with him. So he, he had a burner phone or something. So it, it didn't add up. And um, in the age of publishing, I, even I, I um, 
I would watch the internet traffic coming to the piece because it's I I ran the magazine and I published it so like I could watch it and so we would look for traffic from I he he had spent a considerable amount of time in his youth in Peru he had made some comments that he loved Panama and wanted to move there and so we would just watch traffic and there's nothing there's no um, nothing to indicate that there was a ton of readership from Peru or Panama and so. It was just, it was quiet and, and it, it died down and um, 18 months passed and then the story started again. And uh, then it got very interesting after that. So, Hey, we're just going to stop here for a quick ad break, but stick around. We'll be right back with more What It Was Like. Did you know one in two women wear the wrong foundation? Magic foundation is hard, but Il Maquillage makes it easy. Take the Power Match quiz to find a better match in seconds, customized for your unique skin tone, undertone, and coverage needs. With 600,000 five-star reviews, this best-selling foundation is going viral for a reason. Available in 50 shades of weightless natural coverage. And with Try Before You Buy, you can try your full size at home for 14 days. Just pay shipping. Take the quiz at ilmakiage.com slash quiz. That's I-L-M-A-K-I-A-G-E dot com slash quiz. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. This summer, Instacart presents famous summer flavors coming to your front door. Or pool. Or hotel. Your grocery delivery has arrived, sir. That was faster than room service. No violins in the lobby. Oh, seriously? Anyway, sit back, relax, and get delivery in as fast as 30 minutes. Starring your favorite snacks, drinks, and more. Download Instacart for free delivery on your first three orders. Rated H for hungry audiences. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Excludes restaurants. Additional terms and fees apply. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, don't don't leave me hanging. What what happened eighteen months later? I was gonna say you want to go. stop there. What? <laughs> Harold walked into the Victoria Police Station. He showed back up. He just showed up. Eighteen months later, he was very coy about what he'd been doing. So he showed up one day at the Victoria, which is the big city on southern Vancouver Island, our provincial capital. Showed up at the police station. Basically said, "Here you're looking for me." And they were, and he was arrested, booked, and then I believe went to live with his mother in a town up island. His father had passed away while he was gone, and I believe he went home and basically waited for a trial to start. And it took a long time. Canada is not great with white-collar crime. Uh, In my estimation, they don't take it as seriously as perhaps America, where I live now, does, where, you know, they they take it pretty seriously. But the wheels of justice turned relatively slowly. And so eventually, Harold pled guilty to a single charge, I believe, um, and was sentenced to 13 months in a jail, um, served his time, got out. He was barred from being a financial advisor by the regulatory body and kind of rode off into the distance. It's my understanding he now lives in Ontario, which is in Eastern Canada. Um, and I don't know what he does. He can't work in financial services. He's, you know, you'd ask, you'd guess he might be doing more manual labor because that's you know, when you, when you commit a crime like this, you're not going to get hired in more, you know, office setting, so to speak. And so in the place of, fact it's rumor you know everyone wants to know what he was doing um where did he go how did he get there and so it's all just rumor um when he showed up he definitely had lost a considerable amount of weight he was never a you know he's never overweight but he was quite gaunt and i think someone said he looked like he'd be camping um and 
the rumor, the rumor that I think makes the most sense um, was that he rode his bike south. Um, you know, it gets warmer as you go further south into America. And that he worked um, menial, like, day labor jobs. Um, regardless of what you think of it, uh, in America, there is a vibrant a community of sort of, um, you know, undocumented labor where people just uh, pull up and hire someone for the day. And then that's how you make money. Because Harold, he had to have um, some way to stay, you know, feed himself. And this is the, this is the thing. No one is actually accusing Harold of stealing the money. It's not like he was squirreling it away in a bank account. It's that he was just an horrible investor and lost it all. Now, in some sense, when you run a Ponzi scheme, every dollar you spend is stolen because you should have given that back to the investors. So when you're paying for a meal and you're paying for kids' colleges, you are stealing in that sense. But he wasn't stealing in the sense that he had some secret bank account in America. He really ran away because the, the, the number got to zero and he had to go maintain his uh, lifestyle. So the, the, the theory I heard from a rowing coach of mine who knows Harold as well, everyone knows, was that he'd ridden south to California, had um, been doing just day labor jobs, and then eventually realized that he couldn't do this forever and he had to go home because he had some family, right? Um, and, you know, regardless of what he's done, he still cares deeply about his children, I have to imagine. And so he came home, went through the legal system, um, but never, never told the court, as far as I know, never told anyone what he was doing, which I think is just an extension of like the shame that he will have felt. There were, from 1999 onwards, he was interacting with his victims socially, he's interacting with them professionally. And every time he interacted with them, you cannot tell me there wasn't a deep sense of shame, um, among other things in his life. And so I think not telling the world what he was doing for those 18 months was probably an extension of that shame in the sense that, like, this is an old three-time Olympian. He's a Princeton graduate, you know, from Australia. Princeton is one of the best schools in America about the world. He has an MBA from one of the great Canadian universities. And now, and then he's having to live, you know, hand to mouth as a fugitive in America. That, that there is a deep sense of shame there. And I think that's probably one of the reasons he doesn't, he didn't want to tell that story when he came home. I contacted him as any good journalist did. And I knew he wouldn't respond. I knew he wouldn't respond, but I wanted to reach out and say, I won't think. Yeah, you know, let's tell your story. And sadly, he, he never responded. Yeah, well, let's let's get into the core of this. So it's a crazy story because it's really a, it's like a personality question or it's like a motivation question. You know, like what caused this to happen? And I'd like you to take the lead on unpacking the psychology here. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be the armchair psychologist, I guess, on this. Um, so I never got to the Olympics. I missed going to the Olympics by around the second in 2008, partially because eventually your countrymen beat me at a regatta. Um, they, they won the silver medal in Beijing, so they deserved it. But so I went to um, three, three or four world championships, and then I failed to qualify for the Olympics. And um, that, was that was devastating. It took years to sort of truly overcome that. And I can, you know, the Olympics start today. I can watch them with, with no regret and only good memories of my time as an athlete aspired to be there. But it is a devastating thing to miss your goal. And it's extremely hard transition. Um, I've seen many of my peers struggle to go from the single-mindedness and regimented and singular goal of training for the Olympics to go to the regular dirty life that we all have to leave at, lead at some point. Um, that it's a very common thing. Like, uh, even the Olympic gold medalists and maybe more so for them, um, uh, struggle to become normal human beings afterward. And I suspect Harold had gone to three Olympics transitioning into everyday life is difficult. 
partially because people expect you to be an Olympian at everything, right? It's, it's completely irrational. Just because you're good at moving a boat backwards through water has, has no bearing on like real life. Um, and so there's some, some things work. And, you know, work ethic matters everywhere. But work ethic like, can also go into a, a conversion to an intensity that is not appropriate for a lot of jobs, right? When you, you know, you can be as intense as you want in the rowing world and the athletic world. It usually benefits you. But when you go into a world where you have to, you know, be the low man on the totem pole because you're new to a company, work alongside other people, it doesn't always translate. And so putting on the armchair psychology uh, part of it, Harold went into financial advising. He was doing it for his closest friends. His closest friends, one of the first thing they think about when they thought of Harold is three-time Olympian. And so when Harold hit a problem, which is, the dot-com bubble, stock markets went down around 40%. Harold lost around 40% of his clients' money. He clearly, I mean, this is a fact, he did not have um, the ability to just be honest with his clients and say, look, I'm like everyone else. I lost money in the stock market. He couldn't do that. And I have to, I have to believe part of that is people thinking that Harold was going to be excellent at everything. Um, and, you know, I see that in my life. I know my friends see it. They they assume, like, sports-wise, I'm not actually that good at sports. I like, hand-eye coordination is not my thing. But people kind of assume you're going to be good at it because you're you're good athlete. But I have to sound like, no, let's not play that sport because it, I'm going to embarrass myself. Um, and so I think that's probably the, the root issue here um, was that he had people, he thought, that people had a perception about him that he wanted to maintain. And if he had admitted his initial mistake, he wouldn't have maintained it. The tragedy, of course, being that that would have been totally acceptable compared to what ultimately happened, which is he went from being a bad investor to being a criminal. And um, it was, and I think it was because that he just couldn't, admit to people that he was like everyone else in this facet of life. Mm. I mean, could he admit it to himself? Was he, was he simply incapable of admitting that he lost this game? That's a great question. Um, I'd say this, this is sort of very broad, but everyone convince, can convince themselves of every, anything they need to. And in his letter, he basically said, I knew... He knew he'd lost the money, but immediately he had the belief in himself that he could make it back up. And so at a minimum, he didn't, he didn't, at a minimum, he didn't learn the lesson, but uh, it sounds like he, maybe he couldn't admit to himself. He, maybe there is a thing in his head saying, this was one off, you know, we all get unlucky one day, but I'm still a really good investor. So you give me enough time and I can make up this by outperforming the market over the last couple of years and then we'll get back we'll get back to even and no one will ever know this happened and so yeah i think you're right I and mean, in some level he he didn't take the lesson well oh i'm just normal at this like everyone else he thought he got unlucky perhaps and could make it back up um which is not the and covering investing for long enough i know that is not the lesson to take from that so <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that the Olympics attracts a self-selecting demographic of people who just have this eternal belief in like the mythology of winning. You know, you can turn it around, you know, you like it, it's the uh, like a belief in the underdog story to such a degree where even if Harold lost all his money, he's like, you know what? I'm an underdog and the underdog is coming back next season, baby. And we're going to we're going to win. Normal, normal people don't go to the Olympics. That's right. Yeah, that's what I'm getting you know, at. Yeah, it's. Well, I think is it is it Australian field hockey player who just lost his finger? Did you hear about this? Uh, seems right. I haven't kept up with uh, the latest in field hockey. I think it's an Australian field hockey player who, like, two weeks ago was practicing and it got a stick on his finger and basically severed the top of his finger. And they said you have two options: we can sew it back on but you're not going to Olympics or we can amputate above the middle knuckle. And the guy took around 30 seconds to the side. 
oh, we're taking that finger off. So he's playing in the Olympics, missing, missing half his, his, his ring finger. And that struck me as like, yeah, 99% of Olympic athletes would make that choice because they're not normal, right? Um, it does, it does not rowing for sure, but I have to assume it's the same as works. It doesn't attract well-balanced people. Because well-balanced people are not going to be able to put aside the things that you need to put aside to achieve excellence in this very specific domain. Right? Use rowing. As I said, it's, what are you doing? You're sitting on a tiny boat, often with seven other dudes uh, and a cocktail, and trying to go backwards uh, really fast. It's like this weird, weird thing to spend a decade doing. But so... It attracts, it, it attracts obsessives, it attracts um, narcissists, um, it attracts um, people who might be missing something in their life that balances them out. And I say that all those things while I was rowing apply to me, right? Um, and so they apply to a lot of other people. Um, those athletes, the 10,000 athletes who are going to Paris, you will not find many normal people amongst them. Um, and many of those people, thousands of those people, will have a very difficult next year when the closing ceremonies happen. You know, I have to assume a third of those people are going to retire. And the vast majority of those people are not Olympic medalists. They are just people who went to the Olympics. Um, I'd say that you know, it's still a big honor. But there is going to be a ton of those people who have an extremely difficult time transitioning just to being normal people or as close to normal people as, as the rest of us are. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that every time I turn on the TV and see the Olympics, I think that, you know, we sort of focus on the medalists. We think about gold. Wow, gold. What an honor. You know, all of the focus, it's this myopic focus on gold, silver, bronze. But for the vast majority of competitors, seen another way, Olympics is a factory for creating losers yeah. who yeah. feel like they've squandered years to achieve not what they wanted. I, I don't know. As as a as an athlete yourself, do you ever do you ever find it hard to to watch the Olympics? I I feel a deep deep empathy for the people who come forth. Yeah. And even the people who didn't achieve their goals. So I was running with this four-time Olympian uh, the other day. His name, I'll name him. His name is David Calder. He's a very good friend. I started, you know, when I was in high school, he was my idol. And then we actually became teammates. And now we're just great friends. And um, we were talking about our time on that run. And I said, oh, well, my career wasn't that successful. And he goes, well, I was either. Or I said, "Lock." I said, "Dave, you went to four Olympics and won a silver medal." <laughs> it's like I don't know, man. I think you might have been success, but I know Dave is still disappointed that he doesn't have a gold medal and that his final Olympics in 2012 he got fifth, and that tells you a lot. Normal people, if they had an Olympic silver medal, would you would never have a doubt in the world about. The, the, what you've done and i know dave on most days is like you know I'm, I'm it's okay but he still has concerns years later about that he didn't fulfill his potential um and so i have a i have a real deep empathy for people who go and miss and that's you know those are some of the great stories that we'll see in olympics um i find watching olympics really emotional since i was young i since i was a young boy because my father also missed going to the Olympics by a small amount in 1968. Family trait, sadly. Um, and so every summer we would watch the Olympics just like hour to hour coverage. And we're not a family that watches a lot of TV. And I remember like, even from a young age, being so deeply emotional about um, people who, like the people who weren't winning. And I think having gotten close to that experience myself, I have like even a deeper understanding of failure. Uh, and failure in something that has been so central to their entire lives, their entire identity. Um, and I, I hope that uh, they can transition to the next phase 
um, uh, as smoothly as possible because, you know, it's hard. It, I, I know it's hard. Yeah. Tell me, tell me more about that. I mean, you, you said before that it took you a few years to really get past it. Can you? And I, and I was lucky and I was so lucky. I, it was, I, I know the dates cause it was June 20th, 2008. I was sitting in Poznan, Poland. I'd had lost to the Australians and the Chinese and I needed to come second in a, a race. So Australian Chinese got to go to the Beijing Olympics and I didn't. But I was sitting on the side of the course and I, I thought I'm done. Like I'm retiring. I, I have other things I want to do with my life. Um, and I, I had to support a family. I had to support a girlfriend. I had a great friend group. I immediately, um, a mentor reached out and basically gave me a job. Um, and so I had like all this support system. And even then, it's just sort of this every morning you wake up and you, you think, man, like I was so close. I was like a second away from winning Olympics. Um, and I remember watching the Olympics that summer and a bunch of my friends won gold medals. And I'll tell you, that's a, I don't mess with your mind. Uh, when you want to, how does that feel? I mean, in, in retro, in at the time, very mixed emotions based on who it was. I had some great British friends who uh, won gold. I just thought the, you know, the world that the Canadian men's eight won gold that year. And I trained with them all year long and I had mixed emotions there. I was happy for some of them, unhappy for others. <laughs> um, and it, it, so it was like, it was tough. In retrospect, I'm happy for all of them. What like, cause you know, you mature and you, you, you grow up and you realize like moving a boat backwards through water is not the end goal of life. Um, but that, at that time it was. And so I would say it took me probably two years to be able to think about my rowing career without, um, sadness. Um, but I was just, I was so lucky that I had that support system it really had a great, really fun job, and it's launching into my career. Like, in reality, if I had not, if I had gone to those Olympics, my entire life would be different, and um, that scares me. It, it, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it at this point. But uh, it's, it, it, it's for some for people without a support system, um, it is an, almost a dangerous time. I think. Because you're, it's just a complete, everything is gone from you know, all that, all that regularity and uh, uniformity and drive is, is vanished. And that's a dangerous thing for a lot of people. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if there's any sort of direct, clear evidence that Harold was suffering after he retired from, from being a professional athlete. Yeah, but we can assume that it was hard. We can assume, you know, if he had spent years calibrating his brain to be focused on winning, to find himself losing even secretly was pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. It's there will be instances of it being a smooth transition, but um, I'm not sure I know of any where it's just been, uh, you know, no, no bad things at all ever. I don't. I'm not sure that exists. So, yeah. So it's so you know. To your knowledge, what is Harold doing with his day to day at the moment? Like right now, what's he up to? You know what? I I don't know. I as I said, I think he's moved. He's not on Vancouver Island anymore, as far as I know. He's moved to Eastern Canada, um, and you know, given his background, he's either had to start his own business. Cause I, no, it, you know, you do a background check on him, you're unlikely to hire him, um, or he's doing just more sort of um, you know day to day. Uh, what you would might call a blue collar job, but he has disappeared. Um, he certainly has not stayed connected to the community um, in the same way he was before. You know, the people that I know who spoke to him previously would not be speaking to him anymore, um, which doesn't surprise me. I'm sure he's in touch with, you know, I'm sure he's close with his family. I sure hope he is. Um, yeah. So he hasn't uh, moved back in with his wife to your knowledge. I don't know at all. I, uh, I looked him up on LinkedIn. I couldn't help but notice that he's started a business called uh, Phoenix Consulting. Oh, really? Which I thought, uh, you know, <laughs> like the, uh, the the Phoenix was an interesting uh, that <laughs> choice. <laughs> literary, at least. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, yeah. yeah. And his victims, um, you know, did they just sort of lose everything? And, and that's just the way it is. I think so. I believe there was some 
money recovered via some mechanisms, but in no way were they made whole. Um, and so, and, and there would be no way to make them whole in some senses. And so, you know, there, um, I was asking about them. They're still going strong back on the island, a lot of them, but I, you know, that pain won't have gone away for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've really just got one last question. That is, uh, when you look back at this, what have you learned personally? What have I learned personally? It highlighted for me, to what we were speaking about earlier, it highlighted to me the point of like moving on, right? As I said, I, can, I will watch the Olympics with just unbridled joy for the next two weeks. There won't be a pain of jealousy there. Because it's just, I've, I've come, I, as I said, my life has turned out so wonderfully and it's all, and I can't, I don't think it would have turned out that way if I'd actually gone to it. And so I think that like, if Harold had been able to achieve that sentiment earlier, he might've been a fuller person to be able to tell his investors the truth. But I think they would have accepted it. You know, the stock market went down. And so I think it's in the importance for Olympic athletes, yes, but for anyone really to sort of you just have to put things behind you and move on and then just live by the the standards that we all know we need to live by which is just honesty and integrity and just trying to do the right thing um but yeah it's uh as i said i have empathy for the losers in the olympics i have empathy for harold i i I I really do. I have empathy for what Harold had went through. Uh, and I know that no one wished it had happened, but, you know, I'm not too hard a person. I can't see that even he was struggling with what he was doing. So. Yeah. Yeah. We can assume that he's had a pretty garbage 24 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kip, this has been fantastic. It's been really interesting. What a wild story. I, I love, I haven't, I, you know, I haven't, thought about heroin in quite some time so it's been interesting on the eve of the olympics <laughs> to think about this yeah. story and it's been great, chat, yeah. great chatting with you so thank you if you'd like to read kip's article and i highly recommend you do you can find it on a website called chief investment officer and it's called the departed princetonian olympian financier fugitive we'll put it in the show notes too or you can just google it Please leave us a five-star review on Apple and on Spotify. Also, we'd love it if you'd follow the show. And did you know that we're on TikTok? Yes, we are on TikTok. It's at, as in at symbol, what it was like podcast on TikTok. That's at what it was like podcast. And it's the same handle on YouTube. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Tuffery. It was mixed by Jimmy Saunders, who also did our theme music. Evie Atkins is our intern, our cover art is by Naomi Lee Beveridge, and this whole thing has been a super real production. Juvederm Day is coming soon on August 21st. Buy one $75 Juvederm gift card, get one free. One day only on August 21st. Juvederm Day gift cards can be used on any product in the Juvederm collection. Don't miss out on this once-a-year chance to save. Join Ali now. While supplies last, Skin Vive by Juvederm is excluded from this promotion. Terms and conditions apply. 